Um, it looks like we've got some people online with us and, and looking forward to um, starting. Um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name's Judy Talley. I work with uh, PMD Alliance. I have since its inception. Um, and um, once in a while, I um, facilitate one of the meetings on online or one of our trainings. And I'm here today to um, host Dr. David Sprecher for our Spotlight on Medications. And uh, we're going to be talking today, we've kind of got two working titles for this year talk. One is Navigating the Hype and Hope of Medications, and the other title is Balancing Quality of Life and Side Effects. So it um, gives you an idea of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. For those of you who don't know Dr. Specker, he is the director of the Movement Disorders Program at uh, Banner Sun Health Research Institute and has uh, worked with PMD Alliance for several years now. One of our favorite speakers um, has a wonderful ability to explain and answer questions that come up for all of us. So we're really pleased to have you today. And uh, we know we're looking at your um, uh, PowerPoint, your slides, but in the afterwards, what we'd like to do is um, do some Q&A afterwards. And uh, just for you folks who um, are new to these uh, kinds of uh, online presentations, what we do during the presentation is we mute everybody. And that way, if your phone rings or if you need to get up and chat with someone, um, no one else will hear that. Then at the end of Dr. Sprecher's talk, we will turn off that mute so that you can speak and ask him questions if you like. So you can do that um, either just by speaking into the speaker or if you want to, you can at the bottom of your screen, if you're on a computer, you'll see if you go down to the very bottom, there's a line called chat. And if you click on that chat icon, you can also type in a question and we'll see it and he can answer it that way. The only request I have for all of you is to please keep any questions you have relevant to everyone. We know that there are so many personal situations and personal questions that people um, have. However, we do want to keep the questions so that they relate to all of us as we're listening. So if you have something that's very specific to just you, um, you might want to hold that question and ask your own physician. Uh, later that question rather than on this forum. So without any other things to say, I just want to turn it over to Dr. David Sprecher. We are so glad to have you. Thanks so much. Oh, well, thank you all for having me <clears throat> for the opportunity um, to share some of my perspective about this topic. It's a pretty broad topic. So uh, I apologize if I don't cover your specific question, but I will save plenty of time to do so during the question and answer session. So we'll, we'll try and get through just some key points that I have uh, fairly quickly about balancing quality of life versus side effect of medication, but also being mindful about some of the hype behind different approaches to treatment and, and what, what the reality is. So with one of the important things that I want to start by pointing out is that while Parkinson's is a relatively common condition as we get older, it also is a condition that in the mid 20th century had essentially no available treatments for. And most people within their first you know, 10 years of illness were very disabled and often died of complications related to immobility and uh, difficulty swallowing, often within the first 10 years of having it. This is no longer the typical case with Parkinson's disease. And most people have a honeymoon period of five, sometimes 10 years or more, where they can manage the symptoms well with Parkinson's. However, 
they still are at a higher risk of hospitalization and you know, dying earlier than their peers without Parkinson's disease. That said, we still can mitigate that risk, alleviate these symptoms with a combination approach, not just with medication, but with a lot of the therapies that, for those of you who have been calling in for some of these other conferences online or have been attending in person, you know that this is not just medication, but a multidisciplinary approach to managing Parkinson's and related conditions where exercise and staying engaged in community activities are also very important. When we talk about quality of life, we're talking about being able to participate in everyday activities that uh, make you feel engaged. Um, and everybody has a slightly different perspective about that. It encompasses everything from mood, how you feel, how you're sleeping, to everyday activities and where you're having difficulty due to illness. Now, people with Parkinson's score worse on quality of life than they do compared to people with diabetes or just their everyday peers. It is not just the movement disorder symptoms of Parkinson's, but all the symptoms together that contribute to these problems with quality of life. It's the movement symptoms, though, that usually lead to the initial diagnosis or the referral to see the neurologist where you're then diagnosed with Parkinson's. Some of the most important symptoms that come up and not only lead to diagnosis, but interfere with everyday activities fall in that category that we use the medical term bradykinesia for, but it's really a slowness of movement that happens due to a loss of dopamine producing cells in the brain. For many people, the gait and balance problems are problematic as well, but often become more of a problem later on. And then the tremor may or may not be a problem. For many people, the tremor is something that leads to the diagnosis, but doesn't necessarily interfere as much in their everyday quality of life as the slowness, muscle stiffness, or the gait and balance problems. Now this slowness of movement is different from slowness that people would experience with, say a stroke, where they're just weak, and so they're slow because they're weak. This is a type of slowness that gets worse the more you repeat an activity. For example, when people write, the, the handwriting gets smaller as they go along the page, or when they walk, it becomes more and more difficult to keep the arms swinging. You really have to concentrate more than you did before you had Parkinson's. Now, when it comes to starting treatment for these type of movement disorder problems, there was a nice study that was done about 12 years ago that compared people that started any medication, even you know, a less potent medication like uh, an MAOB inhibitor, like risagiline or sledgiline, compared to people that continued to stay off medication. And what they found was during an 18 month period, using a common questionnaire about quality of life, where a higher score means worse quality of life, people continued to get worse and worse during each follow-up visit during that 18-month period. Whereas people who started medication from the beginning stabilized and their quality of life did not get worse over that period of time. So this is a very telling questionnaire, but there are many people who, you know, like myself, like many of you attending this webinar, and spend all your life trying to do everything right and avoid unnecessary medication, avoid taking medication for pain unless you really, really need it, and have tried to uh, take, have a good diet, exercise regularly, and yet you still come down with an illness like Parkinson's. So it's a very different shift in thinking to stop and think, well, if I take medication, it'll actually improve quality of life and it's appropriate in this circumstance. That said, many people, when they're first diagnosed, don't feel like the symptoms interfere with any activities. 
And so it's okay to hold off on taking medication if those symptoms, the tremor, slowness, stiffness, or gait or balance problems aren't severe enough to interfere with any activities. However, many times people feel like, well, it's okay if I can't write with my right hand because I've learned to do it left-handed. And so they're, they're compensating a lot. And that's where the quality of life suffers is if they're, they're trying to compensate for the symptoms, but don't realize that they may not be doing so successfully. Now, there are a lot of treatments available to treat these motor symptoms. In the 20th century and close to the turn of the century, there was this conception that we should try to avoid using carbidopa levodopa or Cinemet for as long as possible because starting it too soon could actually accelerate the process of the degeneration. That way of thinking has actually fallen by the wayside. We don't view levodopa as toxic anymore. In fact, levodopa can actually be viewed as an amino acid supplement. It really is an amino acid that when it gets into the brain, directly replenishes the dopamine deficiency of Parkinson's. The reason, however, that we may delay its use is that over time, most people who take levodopa will eventually, though it could take five years or more, will eventually have some later complications of levodopa therapy. And we'll, we'll talk about what those are in just a little bit. And so people may start with these dopamine agonists that you see here, or with the MAOB inhibitors that you see here. The problem is that the MAOB inhibitors may not be as potent. And so people are much less likely to have a side effect with MAOB inhibitors, but they may not have a dramatic improvement in their quality of life with it or in their motor symptoms. Now with the dopamine agonist medications, we may be able to delay use of that levodopa, but there are some unique side effects that we need to really be careful about. And I think neurologists in the past 10 years have gotten much better at warning patients about the side effects. In particular, these medications are more likely to cause a problem known as impulse control disorder. The impulse control disorder is one where somebody feels driven to do or think about something and finds it hard to stop. And it usually um, centers around reward seeking behaviors that make you feel good, like gambling. It could be something like buying scratch cards, but for many people it's actually going to the casino and having trouble setting limits. Um, it can be hypersexuality, which sounds for some people like a good thing, but it can actually be problematic when it's too much. And for many people, it also centers around uh, shopping, uh, buying and selling um, cars on eBay even. I've had patients that, that actually come in and say, uh, I think I'm having a problem. Uh, I just bought a new car that I didn't need. So this is something that happens in about 20% of people taking this type of medication. They're also more prone uh, to causing a side effect uh, that's a symptom of Parkinson's, but can be brought out earlier by the medication, which is either hallucinations or actual delusions, like paranoid thinking. Um, the dopamine agonists also can cause people to be more sleepy during the day rather than less so, and over time can cause swelling in the legs that's often unrecognized as a side effect by the other doctors. So these are important side effects that we need to talk about carefully before starting that type of medication. What I often find is that when somebody has tremor that's really bothersome, let's say they've started with one of these medications but aren't getting good control of that tremor, very often we can get control of the tremor with an approach that doctors, I'm not sure who coined this term, uh, but doctors have coined the term rational polypharmacy. And what that is, is it actually is rational. It makes sense to use more than one medication, but potentially in a lower dose than you would if you use just one medication by itself. So very often I'll have someone who's taking the levodopa preparation, the tremor isn't well controlled, but by adding a very low dose of a medication like pramipexil, we're often able to get better control of that tremor, or sometimes adding azelaic or resagiline, selegiline 
Sometimes it requires a combination of all three. Now there are situations where tremor is not well controlled. And this is where we want to choose carefully and you want to have a conversation with your doctor about whether this medication makes sense. This is the category we call the anticholinergics. The one most commonly prescribed is the generic for Artane called trihexafenidyl. This is a medication that can be more effective for tremor, but is much more likely, 100 times more likely than levodopa, to bring out hallucinations. Now I'm gonna just pause here and ask our host to just confirm if everyone can still see my screen. We actually cannot, can you reshare it? It says the host has disabled attendee screen sharing. Huh. I'll just give you a moment to just go through and try and enable that. Yeah, let me check that. In the meantime, let me just continue that um, you know, line of thought that I started. Go ahead and try that again. Okay. Try that one more time. Okay, I think we're up we're and running again. All right, can everyone see the, can you see that yes, slide again? Great. So just bear in mind, if your doctor has been talking about or prescribing medication like trihexafenidyl, we may want you to kind of talk carefully about whether the risk of side effect like hallucinations, which are a hundred times more likely to happen with this medication than with levodopa, problems with thinking and memory, dry mouth, constipation, if those are symptoms that have been worse taking the medication or could occur once you start it, that's something you want to talk over carefully with your doctor. So this is one that I personally keep as a last resort for tremor and generally avoid in patients over 65, expect except in special circumstances where we, the tremor is severe and we tried everything else. Now there have been some studies comparing early treatment with levodopa versus a dopamine agonist or MAOB inhibitor. And overall, patients who start with levodopa do rate their quality of life slightly better than people who have started with one of the other medications. Overall, however, when you compare everybody, the findings are fairly similar in the beginning. So the bottom line is you shouldn't just be dogmatic here and only choose one or the other type of medication based on generalities, but really talk over with your doctor what makes sense for your specific situation. What I encourage you all to be aware of is something that actually my mentor that I did my training with um, coined a term for, which is levodopaphobia. So back in the early 2000s, this was a serious problem that um, we use the term iatrogenic cause of disability. That means it was actually being caused by the doctors who were delaying use of levodopa for a very long time in their patients, even in much older patients who are more prone to hallucinations with dopamine agonists. And we were actually causing disability because we weren't starting levodopa when people needed it, when they were having a lot of problems with quality of life due to slowness, stiffness. So if you um, have never taken levodopa and you're really struggling with movement disorder symptoms, but your doctor keeps telling you you're not ready, you may actually need to get a second opinion. There are some doctors and these are generally doctors that um, are much older than I, but there are some doctors out there that still delay use of levodopa for too long. There was a study published back in the year 2004, which was helpful in disproving this concept that starting levodopa sooner is actually toxic and hastens progression of symptoms. What we did in that study, this is before my time in practice, but our movement disorder um, specialty as a whole did, the Parkinson study group did, is they compared half of a carbidopa levodopa to a whole carbidopa levodopa to two tablets of the 25-100 taken three times a day to a placebo taken three times a day. 
and everybody improved, but of course people on higher doses and compared to placebo improved a lot more in a scale that measures the motor symptoms. And then when everyone came off their treatment, two weeks later, the people who were on treatment still looked a lot better on that, on the motor scale than people who had been on a placebo. So clearly starting the treatment earlier did not hasten the progression in terms of the motor symptoms. The problem is that people on the higher dose were more likely to develop problems with wearing off or dyskinesia compared to the lower doses. What this is, is not just that the medication um, stops working and the tremor comes back, but people can actually feel um, like they're moving through molasses, like they're in a fog, like they're stuck in place when they try to walk. They also can feel shaky inside and actually feel anxious or depressed when the medication wears off. At least 40% of people within their first five years of taking levodopa will develop this problem of wearing off. And similarly, about 40% or more will have at least some involuntary movements from the medication. Only about 10% of people, despite our uh, best therapies and treatment approaches to this, will still have bothersome dyskinesias. So these later complications are not a reason to delay taking the medication because it's inevitable that these problems will develop on the medication. And the most important factor to when these develop is how long you've had Parkinson's disease. So I often tell my patients when the time comes when other medications aren't managing their symptoms enough, it's important that we start levodopa to maintain quality of life, but also for another important reason, and that's people can exercise at their full capacity and will actually have a higher energy level if they're on the right dose or combination of doses of medication for motor symptoms. And if we delay that too long, quality of life really suffers. So we have a lot of different approaches that we can use to address the wearing off and the dyskinesias. But I don't wanna spend the whole time talking about motor symptoms, but also to briefly touch on some of the kind of key decision points that come up with respect to non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. So one of the symptoms that people often have even before they're diagnosed with Parkinson's is a sleep problem. One of the most common is dream enactment behavior. So many people, when they're having an action-packed dream, will move in a way that reflects what they're dreaming about. Now, we don't like to give people sleeping pills if they don't absolutely need them, but it turns out that certain sleeping pills that are actually given at a very modest dose, one that usually doesn't cause morning sleepiness, can really calm the acting out of dreams. These include melatonin and clonazepam. There are some people that have hurt their spouses or their pets, even severely injured themselves jumping out of bed when acting out a dream. So in those cases, it does make sense to add a nighttime medication to prevent the acting out of dreams. Another important problem is sleep fragmentation, which is where you wake up more frequently and may have trouble going back to sleep, or insomnia, where you just have trouble falling asleep. This is something that can really interfere with your daytime quality of life because you're tired. You can't think as clearly if you're not well rested. And so this is where we try to take measures that don't just involve medication, but when we do use medication, we'll often talk about using antidepressants that have sleep inducing properties like trazodone or mirtazapine. So this is, uh, sleep problems are prob probably one of the most common non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's and really important to bring up with your doctor if they're interfering with your quality of life. Another uh, very common problem is constipation. And I have many patients who are religious about using a high fiber diet. And sometimes that alone is effective in controlling the symptom. When it's not, however, we need to recognize that Parkinson's does affect the autonomic nervous system. So movement through the intestines slows down. 
and the medications we use to treat Parkinson's can slow down movement through the gut even further. And so in those cases, because it's unhealthy to have constipation, people can even end up in the emergency room if they're not able to move their bowels. It's important that we at least have a maintenance therapy on board that will keep the bowels moving regularly. One of the most common treatments that we'll recommend for maintenance therapy is over-the-counter Senna, which is a stimulant laxative, or Miralax, polyethylene glycol. Another important symptom where we need to decide whether to treat um, conservatively or when to start medication is orthostatic hypotension. If we were to stain the uh, dopamine-producing nerve endings, with a, a red dye, we would see that it stains very well in normal healthy people, but as you see on the right-hand side, would stain poorly in people with Parkinson's. Similarly, if we stain for the chemical norepinephrine in the heart, it stains very well in a healthy person, but on the right-hand side, you see very poorly in someone with Parkinson's. This is because Parkinson's doesn't just lower dopamine levels, but norepinephrine levels. Norepinephrine is a chemical that's very important to maintain a stable blood pressure when you go from sitting or lying down to standing up. So orthostatic hypotension is a problem where the blood pressure drops with standing, which can result in increased risk of falling due to uh, legs giving out or actual fainting or near fainting. Some people become so debilitated, they're afraid to go out of the house and became, become very isolated and really lose their independence. So this is another really important non-motor syndrome that can really reduce quality of life. Now, many people find that it back down daytime long acting blood pressure lowering medication and increased fluid, even salt intake, we can alleviate the symptoms. It's hard to get people to wear them down here in Sun City, but for those that do wear compression stockings, those can also be very helpful. However, for many people, they do get to a point where these symptoms occur despite our best non-medication approaches. And so there are a list of medications that you and your doctor would have to consider that could really be helpful. Most of these are fairly well tolerated, but the most important thing that we need to do is monitor for an elevated blood pressure laying down that can occur later in the evening. And so we may still have to use a short acting blood pressure lowering medication just at night, but avoid using long acting during the day. One of the other big challenges with Parkinson's is that if we follow people over time, 20 years after they're diagnosed, you know, it's a great problem to have that you're still around 20 years later, but about 80% of people 20 years out will have at least a mild degree of dementia, meaning thinking and memory problems that interfere with everyday activities. And this is where, you know, it's a case by case conversation about whether to start a medication or to switch medications around to try to alleviate those symptoms. Uh, for some people, the tablets can cause a lot of GI symptoms, and so we then have to decide whether the, this patch that's now available as a generic called rivastigmine is really worth the increased cost, because it can be a much more expensive medication than the oral medications. The other important problem is mood disorders, and many people are used to trying to just deal with life events, even if it gets them down, but they find once they have Parkinson's, they are much more prone to depressed mood or anxiety. And that's where we actually know this is, can be related to lower levels of other brain chemicals, not just dopamine and norepinephrine, but serotonin. So antidepressants can be very helpful. And again, case by case, worth discussing. The other uh, real challenge is when people have great difficulty getting motivated to do anything. And you know, sometimes that can respond well to use of stimulant medications like Ritalin, methylphenidate. 
but those in turn could reduce appetite. So we really have to decide case by case if each of these individual motor or non-motor symptoms are interfering enough with quality of life to warrant an additional medication in the regimen. Now there have uh, been concerns that uh, I know there were some articles in the news, particularly on CNN, that there's an increased rate of death in people taking a medication for hallucinations or delusions in Parkinson's disease. Uh, the drug Nuplacid was just approved a couple of years ago as a treatment specifically for hallucinations and delusions in Parkinson's. Now there is a, a warning on all antipsychotic medication that indicates that people with dementia related hallucinations and delusions that are taking an antipsychotic are more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke or to, to pass away than people who are not taking those medications. We don't know, however, if that's because those people who have the symptoms have a more aggressive illness. And that may be the case. That may be part of why we see this increased rate in people taking these medications. The other important problem is that Apart from nuplacid and quetiapine and clozapine, all of the other antipsychotics can uh, sometimes dramatically worsen Parkinson's symptoms. So if you're taking an antipsychotic medication, um, it's important to talk over carefully with your team of doctors, make sure they're all in agreement that the dose and the type of medication is appropriate. But I wouldn't avoid treating someone with hallucinations or delusions with one of these other medications here at the top, if those hallucinations are really interfering with quality of life, if they're very upsetting, if they're causing someone to call 911 because they're convinced that someone's in the house and then the caregiver is having to come home and talk to the police and tell them there's really nobody there. Now, I know that this topic today was mainly about Parkinson's disease, but I just also want to briefly touch on other neurodegenerative illnesses. First of all, people who have dementia in their first year of symptoms have a, and have a condition diagnosed as dementia with Lewy bodies may often be told that they should avoid levodopa entirely because it can bring out hallucinations. However, for some people, even a low dose can be very helpful for gait problems or tremor. And very often, if the hallucinations are mild enough, those can still be managed with or without medication. So it's important that case by case, we weigh carefully whether to add medication and monitor for the side effects, knowing what we're looking for. In people who have multiple system atrophy, they're usually a lot more prone to orthostatic hypotension. And so we need to monitor very carefully when we add Parkinson type medication because that can worsen the orthostatic hypotension. Now people with progressive supranuclear palsy may be told that either that levodopa doesn't work or it may be unclear why it's being used. So I generally use levodopa in this condition, PSP, when people have a lot of muscle rigidity and if they have a lot of um, fine motor skill impairment. But for it to be helpful, we often need much higher doses than what we use in Parkinson's disease. So rather than one pill three times a day, the typical treatment range is between two and four pills of the 25, 100 pills three times a day. People with PSP uh, are more prone to freezing of the gait, and amantadine is something that I may talk about carefully, but have a low threshold back down if the side effects are problematic. So if the gait is actually worse or if people have dizziness or, or leg swelling. And in people with PSP, we need to think more carefully about whether to treat symptoms like involuntary closing of the eyes, called blepharospasm, or involuntary laughing or crying. And finally, uh, much less common is the cortical basal syndrome, where medications usually are much less effective, but food problems or insomnia could still be treatable. And for those um, who are close to someone or know someone with Huntington's, this is a condition where uh, the treatments for mood, anxiety, OCD, 
even irritability, hallucinations, and delusions can be quite effective. And important to still talk about. And also the involuntary movements of Huntington's can be treatable, but the other motor, motor symptoms generally not. So overall, it's important to balance the quality of life impact of symptoms and the potential improvements in quality of life when starting a medication with the possible side effects. And we really have to do that case by case with the individual, taking into account the type of condition you have and also age, because some of these side effects, particularly the hallucinations and delusion side effects, are more common when we give it to an older, the medication to an older patient to treat motor symptoms. It's important that we accept once we've developed a condition like Parkinson's or loved one has, that you likely will need to take at least some medication for symptoms of that illness. And just to you know, become comfortable with that and then to choose carefully when the time comes, which medications are right for you, um, ha having conversation with your treating clinician about that. Now, one area where there's a um, fair amount of hype, but also hope is with the use of the cannabinoids. And this is something where um, we have colleagues in the Western US who are doing studies right now on the use of uh, cannabis type products to treat tremor and essential tremor and Parkinson's, for example. We still wanna get the information from those studies in order to guide us about what the right dosing is with the different products and what side effects to monitor for. And we don't wanna jump to those medications without giving the tried and true medications uh, appropriate trials particularly when it comes to movement disorder symptoms. Another area that there's a lot of confusion about is with stem cell therapy. So one promising area with stem cell therapy is with transplants of stem cells that are derived from one's own skin cells so that we don't have the ethical issues that we had with fetal stem cells back at the turn of the 21st century. And we also don't have to worry about your body rejecting the stem cells because it's your own cells. These are transplants that are by a surgeon directly implanted in the part of the brain that would be responding to dopamine. And the cells are programmed to become dopamine producing cells. This may eventually become a therapy for motor symptoms of Parkinson's that would address the complications of levodopa therapy. But it wouldn't change the fact that Parkinson's is still a progressive illness. So we would still need to develop therapies that actually slow progression and development of the other non-motor symptoms. The other area where I would actually consider predatory and something that you should avoid is the stem cell clinics that will take your fat cells and inject them into your spinal fluid or your bloodstream. There's no clear evidence that that will actually lead to those stem cells going to parts of the nervous system where they're going to become dopamine producing cells or alleviate symptoms of Parkinson's, but there could be risks. There was just an article this week about people going blind from stem cell injections in the eyes. And in Parkinson's disease, we don't really know exactly what the risks should, would be. So nobody should ever charge you money for stem cell therapy for Parkinson's, and they should actually give you a stipend for participating in a carefully monitored clinical trial if you're going to get stem cells for Parkinson's. And I'd say that's an opinion that you will hear from just about any movement disorder specialist or leader in the field. So with that, I will um, wrap up my portion of the talk and close for questions. Okay, all right. Um, did, did you wanna come on again and, and take down your PowerPoint? Yes. So we can see you? Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks so much. That was just really great information. Um, I want to see, uh, I think we've got the mics turned on. So we've got a lot of people who have listened. There's bound to be some questions. For those of you who want to ask questions, um, we'll just take them one at a time and anyone can start. They'll just have to unmute themselves. When they're if you, yeah, down in the lower um, left-hand corner, make sure there isn't a line across that microphone there.
You can also submit questions if you don't want to talk using the chat feature down on the bottom strip. I've got one for you, Dr. Sprecher. Sure. Go ahead. Okay. Well, we've talked, you talked a lot about medications um, and quality of life. Can you speak a little bit about staying active and engaged and exercise as it impacts quality of life? Yeah, so, you know, it's again, quality of life is a very broad topic. And absolutely, I think I, in the beginning of my talk, I, I did point out that staying active and engaged is an important part of your treatment. So we usually want a multidisciplinary team that includes an exercise physiologist or physical therapist, personal trainer even, that can get you the right exercise program tailored to you uh, to really um, include cardiovascular exercise, exercises specific to Parkinson's that allow you to do bigger uh, movements and address gait and balance problems, and also resistance training. Uh, but it needs to be tailored to the individual. Staying engaged also may be helpful to slow the cognitive decline, although this is an area of ongoing research. Okay, we've got one here on our chat. Um, it says, how long does it take to feel the effects of carbidopa levodopa when first beginning to use it? Yeah, so with carbidopa levodopa, this is something where every individual patient is a little bit different. I usually um, will start with a low dose, and if we don't see any improvement after two weeks, then we'll go up to the next dose. And, and generally, we'll give it a couple months to decide the overall improvements. Now that said, there are some people who notice very quick onset of improvement, and it really varies also depending on um, you know, kind of the, the whole set of symptoms that an individual has. So if an individual has more than just movement disorder symptoms, but has a lot of cognitive symptoms, a lot of fatigue or sleepiness that's not directly related to the movement disorder problem, then we have to really clearly decide which symptoms are going to improve with the levodopa and watch carefully for improvement just in those symptoms. Okay, here's another one. Let's see, wait a minute. Um, have you ever heard of high doses? Whoops, it keeps bouncing on me. Um, Enticapone, causing oh. cognitive issues. Yeah. So Enticapone is a medication that is added to levodopa and some doctors will add it appropriately if your medication is wearing off in between doses of carbidopa levodopa. Other doctors will add it just to boost the effect, and that isn't a, a fully accepted approach. So one thing we know is that when you add enticapone to levodopa, because it boosts the level of levodopa, you are more likely to have levodopa-related side effects. So when your dopamine level becomes too high because your overall dose or combination of doses is too high, you can have dizziness or nausea, but even uh, feeling like you're in a fog. Some people say they feel cobwebby in their thinking when their dopamine level goes too high. So we always want to question, is the anticapone being used appropriately to extend the effect of the levodopa between doses? And if you're having side effects once it's appropriately added, then we may need to lower the amount of levodopa we give per dose. So it's, yes, absolutely. Cognitive issues can occur due to too high of a dose of any of these medications or when adding anticapone or any of these other medications to the levodopa. This is important to bring up with your treating clinician. Okay, so then another question. It seems that many side effects are the same as PD symptoms. How can you tell the difference? Side effects with the treatments for motor symptoms of Parkinson's are a little bit different. So for example, with levodopa, when you've been taking it for a while, you can get involuntary movements, but those movements are usually irregular, wiggly, twitchy kind of movements. Whereas someone who has Parkinson's tremor, the tremor has a very steady rhythm to it. So that's one example of where the you know, astute clinician, experienced neurologist can tell the difference. So it's important that you bring up with 
your treating clinician which symptoms you've developed following or what's improved, what's gotten worse following a change in therapy. Most of the side effects of these motor therapies, we call the anti-Parkinsonian drugs, are things like nausea, dizziness, cobwebby thinking, sleepiness, and then with the dopamine agonist, those impulse control disorder problems or hallucinations. So most of the side effects are a little bit different than the movement disorder problems, with the exception that levodopa can cause extra involuntary movements that look very different from the tremor, or usually look different from the tremor of Parkinson's. How about commenting on the meds available for off time, Apikin, Ambrisia, and Gokovri? Yeah, so those are three of the newest medications available to treat off periods. We still don't have a lot of experience yet with Inbrija, that's an inhaled levodopa, but we expect that the same side effects you can have from too much dopamine, from too high a level of levodopa, can occur with the Inbrija. So things like dyskinesia in particular, but also nausea or dizziness. With the Apican, that's an injectable therapy to treat sudden off periods. And that's one where people have to pre-medicate to prevent nausea. Another thing we need to monitor carefully for is worsening or actually emerging of the orthopedic hypotension where there's a dizziness, lightheadedness due to low blood pressure standing up. Also, theoretically, it can lead to the impulse control disorder problems that we see with other medications uh, in that dopamine agonist family. With the Gokovri, it's important to recognize that Gokovri is simply a slow release formulation of amantadine that's gradually absorbed during, mostly during the daytime if taken at night, which can address the problem of insomnia. If someone's had insomnia with amantadine, it may be less likely with this Gokovri. However, side effects like increased orthostatic hypotension, dizziness standing up, swelling in the legs, and hallucinations are just as likely to happen with Gokovri as with generic amantadine. So if your doctor is actually switching you from one to the other because you had hallucinations on generic amantadine, that's probably not going to work out so well. Hey, thank you. Um, we've got one. Does selegiline require less amount of ritari? So selegiline is in that category along with resagiline and zadago, uh, we call the MAOB inhibitors. So what it does is it boosts dopamine levels. So it may allow you to get more effect from your levodopa preparation, including ritari. It may also help extend the duration of effect if you have wearing off between dose. So it's important to kind of review with your treating clinician if you've added selegiline to the ritari, how you're doing with symptoms, and also whether you're having side effects like increased dyskinesia. So anytime we add an extender like selegiline, resagiline, or even enticapone or stilevo, we may need to lower the amount of levodopa, so the dose of ritari or the dose in carbidopa levodopa, if there's a side effect like increased dyskinesia. Thank you. I had a question, do you, can you comment a little bit on branded versus generic medications? So one of the challenges in treating people with Parkinson's is that while generic medications are supposed to be less expensive, it can often take five years or more for the cost to go down. We're seeing that in particular with resagiline and also with the rivastigmine patch. That's also another thing to consider is the FDA, the way they regulate medication is that the dose from a given manufacturer um, per pill doesn't have to be 100% identical to what it says on the bottle. So if you're expecting 100 milligrams, they may allow them to give you 100 plus or minus a milligram, a few milligrams even. Each manufacturer is gonna have different quality control in place, and so the actual dose per pill may be slightly different. So the important thing to be careful about if you're taking a generic is when the color of the pill changes and the size or shape changes, 
it may be that your generic manufacturer that your pharmacy is using has changed. And so the effective dose may change slightly. If you're using a brand name product, you're gonna still be getting it from the same manufacturer every time. So it's unlikely there's gonna be any fluctuation in the amount uh, per pill. That's probably the main consideration. Thank you for that. Um, it looks like there is one a question I don't think we've discussed yet. How effective would exercise, even if monitored through a, monitored through a doctor, improve overall muscle, muscle development? How exercise would impact muscle development? Yeah, so, you know, important consideration is as we get older, our muscles tend to atrophy unless we really work them. And so for each decade of life, that atrophy is more likely to happen. So it's like we had that Nike commercial back in the 20th century, just do it. It's still better to you know, get some form of exercise, any form of exercise than none at all. However, it's important that you have someone advise you on what's right for you so that you don't hurt yourself. And this is where doctors may tell you, you should just go exercise, but they may not be able to actually monitor how you're doing it. Um, you know, some, of, some doctors actually have a background having been a, you know, a, a personal trainer or even physical therapist before they became a doctor, but the major, and, and many of them are athletes themselves, but they're still not able to work with you one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one in the gym and make sure that you're doing the exercises correctly. So, you know, absolutely exercise, whether it's recommended by the doctor or you decide to do it on your own, can improve muscle development. But it's important that you have someone check, make sure that you've got proper form uh, when, and that you're not going to hurt yourself. Okay. Um, there's a, a question. Please describe the patch you just mentioned, what class of drug and what it treats. Yes, the patch that I mentioned just a little while ago was called Rivastigmine, it used to be known under the brand name Exelon. That's a medication approved to treat dementia related to Parkinson's. Dilene manufacturers like Apotex be different as manufacturer pharma Myla? Yeah, so Selegiline is a great example where there's a lot of different generic manufacturers. Mm -hmm. And so even though it says five milligrams on the pill, that may be plus or minus a few percent, but probably the same with each batch or from a given manufacturer. So it's just that at, if your pharmacy changes generic manufacturers, the dose may in turn change a few percent, but then be stable with each batch. It looks, looks like we've come to the end of the question. I have a question. Um, and so is there any final words you have for us that we didn't think to ask about that we need to know? I had a question. Maybe it's oh, we got a question. Okay, go ahead. It's not really a question exactly, but um, my recent experience was I've been on levodopa for years, and all of a sudden I went downhill really badly and could hardly walk, and I had been doing very well. and. My doctor, um, Parkinson's doctor, thinks that it was because I had been on an antibiotic, which changed the composition of the gut so that it was not um, absorbing the levodopa anymore. Have you encountered that situation? Absolutely. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. So it's not just your medications for Parkinson's we need to watch carefully, but also the other medications that you're using for other conditions. It's true, when people take antibiotics, sometimes they don't seem to absorb their levodopa as well. And so you know, there may be a period of time, sometimes a couple of weeks, till the, as you said, the bacteria in the gut get back to the normal composition and then you start absorbing better. So we will sometimes recommend, if we're concerned about absorption issues related to antibiotics, that you use um, either yogurt or supplements that contain you know, the healthy bacteria, probiotics, in order to restore that balance. Yes. Well, it has another, been weeks, but now I'm back pretty much. Yeah, glad to hear. Now another area that brings up an important other point 
is there are some antibiotics that um, are sometimes used for um, like bladder infections that can interfere with breakdown of the Parkinson's medications. So you want to make sure that if you're taking a new medication for uh, any type of infection that your doctors check, make sure there's not an interaction. Um, for, uh, for example, the uh, risagiline is one where the breakdown could be interfered with, with uh, some antibiotics. And that can lead to a, a too high a level of dopamine and, and the dyskinesias could be worse. So always make sure whoever's prescribing to you um, has your updated medication list. And nowadays when we're typing in the prescription, it'll usually warn us about an interaction uh, because we'll have all the whole list in the computer. Okay, well then the other question is, are there some foods that would not be good to uh, eat, to take? Yeah, there's no food that's been proven to be uh, either um, helpful or harmful for Parkinson's. Um, there's never been a study that showed caffeine or coffee was bad for you, for example. But the, I think the main warning is protein can interfere with absorption of the levodopa. However, I have some patients who absolutely cannot take their levodopa unless they take it after a full meal because it makes them too nauseous. So I would rather that people, if that's the only way they can take it, take their levodopa after a full meal, and if they're not absorbing it as well, then we can always increase the dose. I'd rather they do that than not be able to take levodopa at all. So that's an important caveat is there's no one right way to take levodopa with or without protein. It has to be tailored to the individual based on side effects. That's a good tip. Um, does nicotine patch work, patches work? You know, there was a study on nicotine patches in Parkinson's and that didn't pan out as being effective in Parkinson's. So I, um, it's great for smoking cessation and the right person, but not as a treatment for Parkinson's. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for having me. I'm going to need to run off to clinic. We are so glad you took time to talk with us. Great information as always. So thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. All right. Thank you all for having me. Take care. Bye. Thanks. Also, for those of you who are still on, um, Dr. Sprecher will share the PowerPoint with us. So if you want to uh, email us, info at pmdalliance.org, and we'd be able to send that out to you. Okay, well, thank you all for attending. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.